And yes, one day at a time dealing with COVID-19. I'll just a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Montreal. I did my medical school in Montreal, then psychiatry residency in Toronto. And now I work at McMaster University in Hamilton. But I retain from Montreal my loyalty, the Les Canadiens, the hockey team, which I grew up with. And I was just going to tell you, I don't know if you recognize this person. This is me with Jean Beliveau, who was one of the star players for the uh, Montreal Canadiens hockey team. And he was a wonderful person. He passed away a few years ago. He was quite iconic in Montreal, but he was uh, one of these truly humble, nice person. He had come to Hamilton, which is where I met him to do a pro bono charity event. So this is the enemy. I think I, I have a feeling we've all seen this slide before, once or twice or a hundred times. This is the enemy. And this is hard. Uh, it's okay to acknowledge what most of us feel. This is hard. This is hard stuff. And feeling stress does not mean we're not coping well. A, as we've been hearing about by uh, Sanda, it's a normal human response, especially now. And what we want to try and do is manage our stress effectively so our stress, which is normal, does not become distress. And we're all under some stress now. Winston Churchill, I just like this quote that he, I like a lot of his quotes, but he had one, when you're going through hell, keep going. Sometimes one foot in, the, in front of the other, keep going, is really helpful. And Bob Dylan, who I grew up with when I was a kid, in one of his songs, talked about the times they are a-changing, and yes, we are living in those times now. I think we know that. Uh, this is... Um, I'm going to quote the five C's, and this is from an article from that I read who, that was written by Mamta Gautam, uh, who's a psychiatrist in Ottawa, and uh, I, I, I've kind of uh, added to this and shifted a little, but I based uh, some of what I'm saying on, on, on this useful article I thought she wrote with the five C's, control, commitment, connections, calming, and care for self, the five C's. So starting with control... Some problems we can control and some issues we can control. And for instance, with dealing with the COVID pandemic, we can control how we follow the guidelines. We can wash our hands. We can socially distance. We can uh, wear masks. We can not touch our face. All the things we've been hearing about. So these are all things that we can control. That's instrumental stuff, but also just trying to be as positive we can be, being as kind as we can be in these times of stress trying to enjoy times at home. There's some things that we can kind of work on ourselves that we can control, and that's kind of called problem-focused coping, where we can somewhat change the problem by because some of it is in our control. Now, there are some issues that we cannot control, and that's really called emotion-focused coping. So predicting what's ahead, we don't really know. Knowing how long this will last, we still don't really know. Worrying about whether other people are following the, following the guidelines, well, we can't really control that. But what we can control is our emotional response to these things. And that's called emotional focus coping, where I can't control the issue, but how it affects me, how I respond to it, that I can control. And I think that's important as well. Now, we also can control how much time and energy we spend thinking about COVID-19. Um, and we can limit time on social media, reading. Getting blocked here. I'm trying to see if I can remove. And I can't. Um, whoops. Sorry about that. Oh. Now I'm, yeah, let me get rid of Okay. It's moving. So I'm just going to try and minute. Okay, sorry for that. Um, how much time and energy we spend thinking getting back to this about COVID 19? Limit time on social media, reading about it on television. Do what feels right for you. So there's a lot of stuff out there on COVID 19. And I guess each of us knows. So many people have said, you know, I, I, I do this and that's it for the day. And, and that all makes sense to me. So I think we all know what works for us. You don't want to be inundated by the, by the info. And also sometimes on the media, the info can be a little sensationalistic because that what, that's what can draw viewers or readers. So 
I think it's important to stick with trusted sources of information. And I, I just put a few up there, but like the Public Health Agency of Canada, Government of Canada has COVID-19 updates. Ontario government has updates. The Ontario Medical Association has updates. The CBC CTV News, I've looked at that. And from the US, the Center CDC, the Center for Con Disease Control, you want to get reputable updates. And knowledge is good, but you want to decrease the noise. So the next C is committed commitment. And it means committing to actions that are helpful for us. So obviously, the things we know about washing, social distancing, wearing masks, etc., committing to that, but also committing to staying in touch with people. Uh, this doesn't have to, social distancing doesn't have to be social isolation. And we're social beings by nature. So contact the others by phone, text, FaceTime, Zoom. We've all become a lot better on Zoom, though obviously I wasn't perfect here today on Zoom, but uh, that's helpful. That's important stuff to commit to. Commit to activities that we like, cooking, doing things. Commit to physical exercise, which Sandra mentioned as well, and I'm going to allude to that also. Um, meaningful activities for you. Whatever gives you some peace and joy, commit to that. And just self-kindness. Commit to being kind to yourself. Give yourself a break. It's a, These are tough times and for all of us, and it's important to be kind to oneself as well as to others. Um, if you are fortunate enough to maintain a workplace or a virtual workplace, and I am able, thankfully, to be able to do some virtual things, but I can I can still speak to people online from my colleagues at work, but you can offer to help people, ask for help, share resources. I've learned a lot from other people about what's useful, how to get things from where, lots of useful information. And again, this the sea of connecting is, and sometimes you have to make sure of it, but plan to spend time with your family, people that you love, enjoy family meals together, watch movies, dance, play board games, whatever works. If you're living alone, you can still stay connected to family and friends by phone, emails, FaceTime, Zoom, etc. Use technology as you are able to. And remember, don't underestimate the phone. It remains a very important connective, connected instrument. Again, connections. Social distancing should not mean social isolation. Reach out to people who you love and who love you. Reach out to those who are alone and isolated. We can be very helpful for many people. Offer to help others if you can. Some people, you can, you can buy groceries, pick up something at the pharmacy. Just listening to people, reassuring people. So connecting to people, friends, family, etc., and being helpful. Very important in terms of connectedness. The next C is calming. And for calming, what I wanted to say is... Um, Allow your feelings. It's not, as I've said, it's natural to feel anxiety, to have fears. We all do. We're all worried about getting COVID-19. We're all worried about getting it or passing it on to people. We're all struggling with the isolation of social distancing. You know, for many people with loss of jobs or job changes, worrying about finances, these are all normal and real stresses. You don't have to deny them. And actually it's useful, we know, to vent feelings and you can share how you feel with a trusted person, a trusted friend or family member that you can share things with, that is useful. And there's some literature that talks about if you write, if you journal, if you write out your feelings in a journal, studies have shown that if you sit with the feeling for 20 minutes, that's long enough to express it, process it, and let it go. So for many people, journaling some difficult emotions can be very helpful. Use cognitive therapy, and I'm not going to go into cognitive therapy in depth. Cognition are just, is, cognitions are our thoughts. It's the, the thinking patterns we have. And sometimes we can reframe our thinking. So there's something in cognitive therapy called catastrophizing. So when we think about COVID-19, my life is over, the world's going to come to an end. That would be seen as catastrophizing. And what we want to do sometimes is challenge what we're thinking. Well, no, maybe the world isn't going to come to an end and maybe lots of, you know, yes, some difficult things are happening, but there's lots of good things that are still happening too. So that's kind of reframing your thinking. It's a nice way to challenge oneself. And again, as Sanda mentioned, use gratitude. That can be very helpful for all of us. And just identifying some positive things to help shift away from negative thinking. And you can do that every day if you want. But just think about things we can remain grateful for or just thinking more positively. You know, it, 
There's been some very positive developments recently about a vaccine. Yes, it's still going to be a little bit of time, but you know, hopefully a vaccine will be developed. And that's obviously going to, if that happens, that'll be a real help to everyone to end all this. But uh, that is lots of people are, across the world are working on that. We know that some things have worked. Social distancing and hand washing has worked. If you look at the numbers clearly, so we have some control there. So that's kind of a reassuring thing too. We understand this virus better than SARS. We have the genome of the virus. Hopefully it'll help over time develop some treatments as well as a vaccine. So I think there are positive things we can think about it. And, and, and also in our lives, I think there's, yes, we're all dealing with some difficult stuff, but there are also some things, you know, there's still people we, we care about that are around and we can talk to and we can be grateful for that. Or if we are able to do some work, we can be grateful for that. It's obviously going to be unique to where our lives are at. Also for calming, I'm going to talk about burning off energy and exercise. Again, as Sanda alluded to, is hugely important. And uh, again, exercise outdoors if you're able to. Exercise at home. Go for a run, bicycle. Doing housework indoors. Again, doing yoga, dancing, anything. Whatever you like to do, burning off some of the energy is calming. It helps us. Um, other ways of calming down, uh, you know, spirituality and faith. And depending on how that fits in one's life, that can be a very calming part of one's life to turn to. Breathing exercises, and again, Sandra was referring to that. I'll, I'll allude to one briefly, which is uh, box breathing. And I think that was kind of about inhaling and exhaling and, and taking some time. But box breathing, if you consider the four sides of a box, um, so four sides of a square, let's say you, the first side is you inhale, and you say the word relax to yourself, and at end inhalation, end inspiration, you count, you hold the inspiration, you count one, two, three, four. That's the second side of the box. Then you exhale and you say the word relax to yourself. That's the third side. And then at end expiration, you count one, two, three, four. In other words, slightly hold your breath at the end or let don't breathe in right away. That's called box breathing. That can be very helpful. And you can do three or four box breathings in a row anytime you feel like it or anytime you feel stressed out. That can really help people feel a lot calmer. Visualization is another way of calming oneself. And that really just means thinking of very pleasant scenes in your mind any time of day, but also if you're, if you're upset about something, visualizing something, a scene or a people that help calm you. That's called visualization. That can be helpful too. I also, I used to teach people progressive muscle relaxation. Now I just tell people to go to YouTube, type in progressive muscle relaxation takes about 10 minutes or so. It, it involves tensing and relaxing different muscle groups, about 10 muscle groups of the body. You, you're meant to do it when you're lying in bed uh, with your eyes closed in a darkened room and you're not to be disturbed for these 10 minutes. And for many people, it's a very, very good way of relaxing yourself. And um, it's not meant to be used once a week on a particularly bad day when it really works best for people is if you make this part of your lifestyle. So I do recommend to people when I talk about progressive muscle relaxation, doing it twice a day, every day, morning and night. And as often, in fact, you can do it as often as you want, but I do recommend it making it a lifestyle change morning and night it can help you go to sleep too. If you do it in bed at night and many people have found that very useful. So that's what I also recommend to calm oneself is, and you can get that off of YouTube. And then as Sanda mentioned, meditation, yoga, or any ways you like to meditate can be very useful today on your daily regimen to help, to help calm yourself. That's one of the calming mechanisms. The, la the, other, the next C is caring for oneself. And again, this caring for oneself does include, and I alluded to exercise, but that's also caring for yourself. Exercise is good for our, you know, it burns off energy. It's good for our vent, vent, venting emotional distress. It's also good for our physical well-being, and we know that there's studies showing that exercise helps the immune system. So as Sandra was saying, I'm going to reiterate that, exercise is very important. The other thing that's really important for coping and dealing with stress is getting enough sleep. And there's something in medicine we call sleep hygiene, and there's a few things we do for that. But one is to have good sleep. Often you want to establish a bedtime routine, and it means getting up and going to sleep at around the same time. You don't have to worry about it. It doesn't have to be exact. But essentially, 
try to go to bed and go to sleep at the same time. That's good for our bodies to establish a certain rhythm. I'm known in our psychiatry department as the no caffeine guy. So uh, I'm big on not drinking caffeine, especially if you're feeling stressed or nervous. So again, I leave that up to everyone. If caffeine doesn't bother you, that's fine. But if you're feeling stressed, I would suggest, I would suggest to everyone to consider no caffeine. Uh, coffee has the most, coffee has caffeine. Energy drinks obviously have caffeine. Tea has caffeine, about half as much as coffee, but still a fair bit. And cola has caffeine, again, less than tea. But uh, they all have caffeine and they're all additive. So if you are feeling stressed out, I recommend to people, and they make decaf coffee, decaf tea, decaf cola, try to make yourself decaffeinated, see if that helps. That often helps with sleeping as well. Again, for sleep hygiene, you don't want to have a heavy meal or do heavy exercise. Exercise is good, but you don't want to do it near bedtime because that can get the body going. It can keep you up. For many people, screen time can be awakening, alerting. So be careful about screen time in bed. If it doesn't bother you, that's fine. But uh, looking at the iPhone or uh, TV, for some people, again, energizes the brain. So if, if that makes you more awake, then obviously restrict that. And the other thing I'd say, if you're lying in bed and feeling stressed out, just don't pressure yourself to fall asleep. Our body's resting. You are in a relaxed phase. Just kind of know that's helping you, helping yourself. And you don't have to pressure yourself to absolutely fall asleep. Learn to enjoy the downtime that some of us have now. You know, uh, when this all started and we knew we were going to restricting ourselves a lot, well, I'm going to read those 10 books by uh, Tolstoy that I wanted to read. No, that stuff, you know, do these courses, all that stuff. If it did happen, good for you. But for most of us, it doesn't. What I would say is just enjoy the downtime. Do stuff that you want to do, that you enjoy doing. Cooking, baking, phoning friends, board games, puzzles. If you do read Tolstoy, that's fine. But just reading anything that brings you pleasure is fine from where I sit. Listening to music, TV, it's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to do those major Tolstoy readings. And, and laugh. Laughter is therapeutic important to keep your sense of humor going it works for me i'm hoping it works for you as well keeping your sense of humor can be very valuable at these times i'll just comment briefly on psychiatry where does that actually formal psychiatry fit into this and one thing is i'd say a lot of what we are all feeling now is completely normal it is not a disease and for the great majority of things just do some of the things i've been talking about and, and sanda was talking about this morning that's what you do it doesn't mean you have a psychiatric illness if you're feeling stressed out I will say that for some people, if the symptoms persist and they become quite debilitating, then maybe we want to look at if a psychiatric illness is happening. And that's when you can speak to your family doctor who can refer you to a therapist or a psychiatrist. But that's really, I'd say, a minority of cases. And it's when symptoms become very serious and quite debilitating. So again, from a psychiatry standpoint, we are watching for something called clinical depression. And, and that doesn't just mean feeling anxious or sad. That means you feel a deep sadness, and along with that, lots of other things are happening. You're not sleeping well, you're not eating well, you have low energy, you don't feel interested in much, you don't enjoy much, it's hard to focus, and sometimes you can have suicidal thoughts. And if these symptoms persist, this does need medical intervention. And in today's world, we have excellent treatment for depression, which is counseling plus medication. I've listed a few of the antidepressants there. And we usually don't use antidepressants alone. We combine them with counseling. And really, we have excellent results now for depression. So again, this is not this is a minority of people, I'd say at this time. But you can see when, when these symptoms that I've just described on this slide persist, that is very debilitating, very difficult. And that's when I would involve uh, mental health and, and potentially family medicine, psychiatry. I'll also mention generalized anxiety disorder. Look, uh, we're, all, we're all tense about, you know, we, normal, we all worry a little bit. That's life and that's normal. And we're all worried a, somewhat about COVID-19 now, obviously, and that's normal. But if this really starts building up to an extent that's, and you're just worrying about anything and everything, and it is, feels out of control, it's getting in the way, it's kind of paralyzing you, it's hard to function, and it's not going away again, this I, I would involve mental health and family doctors, psychiatry, counselors. Um, here again, medications and counseling can be very, very helpful. Often for milder forms, counseling alone can be helpful, but as it gets more debilitating and, and severe, then often medications and counseling can be helpful and 
generalized anxiety disorder, again, very treatable in today's world. There's also called something illness anxiety disorder, where you start really worrying about being physically ill and you can't stop thinking about it. And it goes on hours a day and it goes on for weeks and weeks and it gets in the way of your life. Now, of course, in today's world, you have to separate that from the normal worry of COVID that we all have. Um, we're all worrying about COVID somewhat. But again, if it starts absolutely dominating your life and you can't stop thinking about it in a way that is really affecting you, then you know, I would start speaking either to a family doctor, a counselor, and potentially psychiatry. And here again, counseling and if really severe medications can be very, very helpful. We have good treatments for all these things I'm describing. But again, I want to reiterate that overall, almost all of what we're feeling is normal. It can be dealt with ourselves in the way we've been talking about today and with the help of people we are close to. When I do talk about these psychiatry interventions and medical interventions, it's meant for the persistent and very debilitating issues that I've just described in the last few slides. These are much fewer in number, but if something like this is happening, then it, I, I really would say it is important to use professional services when applicable in these kind of situations. The last thought I think I have is care for yourself. Remain optimistic. We're going to get through this together. Be kind, stay connected, look out for each other. We are stronger together. And thank you very much.